Hi, everybody. Welcome to Tapping the Wine Cellar, where we are going through Father Robert Schreider's book, In Water and in Blood. This week, we're talking about Chapter 4. And uh, as we last week, we have Father Keith Branson. We have Companion Director Mickey Otto, Candidate Newton Lee, and we have Candidate Greg Heaver. So, Father Keith, why don't you take it over? All right, thank you very much. We're talking about chapter four of In Water and in Blood. And the scripture that Father Schreider mentions is the first part of Isaiah 62, which talks about the warrior trampling the wine press. It's a very interesting bit of literature as far as biblical literature goes. It comes from a part of Isaiah that was written at about the time that the captives were returning from Babylon. So the time period isn't the time period when the prophet Isaiah lived, it's centuries later. And the, the placement of it is in a, a series of oracles about the lands around the Holy Land. The warrior is approaching, it's in a dialogue, the warriors approaching from the southeast, which is where the land of Edom is. The Edomites were historic enemies of the Jewish people. And the watchman notices the warrior approaching and asks, why are your garments red? And the warrior says, I've been treading the wine press of my wrath, and I bring vindication to Jerusalem. The purpose of this for the immediate audience was to give reassurance of God's saving power that was going to act on their behalf. In some ways, it's problematic because in the history of Catholic theology the past hundred years, it's been connected to Jesus crucified, which is a difficult thing because this warrior image does not connect with the suffering servant of second Isaiah at all. And so we have to pull apart the meaning of the story and take a deep dive into things in order to figure out what the message is for us today. In this, Bob unpacks a very difficult topic, the, typical, the topic of God's wrath, which gets into some basic human emotions, gets into basic human injustice. I think he's good at talking about the dangers uh, and the nature of anger, as well as wrath as a concept, and rage, which is unfocused wrath, which uh, a rage which destroys everything around it. Wrath is a accumulation of injustice. And anger is really a natural biological response of an individual or a group toward injustice. And I will pass this over to my friend, Vicki. Well, um, I'm gonna do something I uh, don't usually do, and I'm going to avoid the whole conversation of anger and wrath for the moment and talk about um, garments. Um, because that was one of the parts of the chapter that really intrigued me was Bob's discussion about the garments that the watchman saw. There was, he talked about a combination of colors and the watchman only at the beginning said I, he saw only the crimson of the warrior's garments. And remember, crimson was a royal color. It was um, fabric that was used for people in nobility or, or, or higher powers. But then as the person came clo closer, the watchman noticed the blood stains became evident. And I really had to reflect for a moment as I read that about our relationship with God. How do we see God? If we see God from a distance, do we see God that's all powerful, beyond conflict, beyond reproach, that um, the, the mighty you know, mighty warrior, mighty, the mighty one? Or do we have a more intimate relationship with God where we see the blood stains, the blood stains for working for the victims of the poor and the suffering? We have to get up close to see the blood. 
if we stay far away, we stay away from the mess. And so I really, the, those contrasted colors really, I found that very fascinating. One of the other parts of the chapter that I also found fascinating was Bob's discussion about memories, because as I read this passage from Isaiah, I thought, how does memory have anything to do with um, God's anger and rage? But Bob makes a point of saying, as many historians have said, for example, uh, people who are historians regarding the Holocaust, it's important that if we allow certain memories to glide away into oblivion, it's some it's a way of reassuring ourselves if we make if we erase it if we make it go away then maybe it didn't happen or it really didn't matter it really wasn't important and has somebody who's always i've I'll always had a great fondness for history thanks to my parents um that cultivation of memory that has part of our precious blood spirituality that was a new comprehension for me to that because we have to remember that. But then also, as you think about it, every time we go to mass, every time we celebrate Eucharist, when the presider holds up the cup and he says, do this in memory of me, Jesus is a very dangerous memory. He's reminding us of that. Do this in memory of me. So now I'm going to let Greg talk about anger and all that stuff, and I'll get back to you on that one. I don't know if I'll touch on anger a whole lot, but um, one of the things that first caught my attention when I was reading this chapter was the stark difference in kind of feeling or nature that I caught. You know, in chapter three, you talk about ritual, and today our rituals generally are pretty clean. We don't literally sprinkle people with blood. We don't take animal carcasses and split them open on altars. You know, we bless people with water. We anoint people with oil and we use incense. You know, these don't have like leave physical markers on us. Um, but this chapter has a totally different tone. It it, for me, it evokes a lot of visceral images in my mind. Um, you know, very, very realistic and I mean, very bloody, very gory. It was just kind of interesting to see the contrast between the two. Um, the point that really kind of caught my attention was when Bob talks about how blood is um, a part of the frame of memory that keeps open a channel for vindication. Um, he goes on to say that God vindicated Jesus' death by raising him from the dead, and that becomes a sign and a guarantee that the sufferings of Jesus' followers even followers of today will one day experience God's own vindication as well. Um, I think for us that points towards, you know, despite the great difficulty we may have in carrying out God's work and building the kingdom and, you know, taking on the work of reconciliation, there's going to be a lot of pushback, a lot of opposition to that work. Um, but this puts us within the frame of mind that, you know, God is the one that started this work, this work of mercy and reconciliation. And ultimately it's God that brings it to completion at the end of time. But in the midst of that, Bob Schreider said this in his course that, you know, God starts the work of reconciliation. God brings it to completion, but in the middle, we have our own part to play in that work. You know, we're not called to be passive bystanders but rather people going out into the streets and being close to those who are on the margins, those who've been bloodied and beaten. You know, those are the people that we're called to be close to. To continue off of what Greg was speaking about, I was thinking about how there is this tension between vindication and being vindictive and how it's very challenging for us because we all want to be vindicated, but usually the emotion that's driving it is a very uh, negative, resentful, vindictive emotion. And how do we as human beings process the desire for vindication and also, I think, avoid that sort of vindictiveness that is very human? And as I was reading, there was one 
small paragraph in uh, on page 43, uh, Bob writes, the blood flowing from this rind press is mingled blood, the blood of the innocent and the blood of wrongdoers. Because it is mingled, it can no longer be distinguished. The symbols are muddled together. As I was reading this, I wonder if this is one of the more challenging pieces of the spirituality. I think on some level, we do acknowledge that we're all sinners, but how do we see each other as actually part of some of the, you know, I think we still see ourselves as being separated from a lot of the evil that's happened. What happens to our understanding of who we are if we are truly mingled with wickedness, with evil doing? I think that's a good observation, Newton. Um, in some ways, we all kind of bear in our makeup, both conquerors and the conquered somewhere back in our history. And having uh, in American history is definitely a mixed heritage for many of us. For, for all of us, to some extent, uh, we, were, we came to this country because we were downtrodden. We received, our ancestors sought opportunity and yet they took advantage of others in trying to accomplish what they did. So we're being of a mixed blood, you know, that's, that's something that God has to redeem, I think. We need to uh, remember that there's no, frequently in human dealings, there's no clear distinction between evil and good. Uh, good people have dark sides no one's a perfect saint and no one is a perfect sinner the problem with the with with just the idea of lashing out to try to right a wrong by force you catch both the innocent and the guilty in the wine press which is why we can't be trusted to do it ourselves uh, we have to leave this up to god Okay, I promise now I'll talk about anger. Um, I really like Bob's discussion about anger and wrath because sometimes I think anger gets a bad rap. I think we are, because um, to go has Greg said so wonderfully and I was just like, yes. When he talks about this spirituality is messy, it's ambiguous, it doesn't make, sometimes it doesn't fit in the box. I think anger and wrath sometimes don't fit in the box of what conventional wisdom says is appropriate behavior. So I really like the discussion about anger and wrath, um, especially when he talked about injustice is often ingrained in a community. It attacks the very possibility of decent relationships among its members. And so the anger grows into a wrath because of that injustice. And I thought, that I just thought Bob wrote this, what, 20 years ago, and we're living that right now in this very day. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was we, we touched a little bit about reconciliation and Bob really made it a point and I was so happy to read it when he said, sometimes we rush into reconciliation and sometimes there's people who rush into reconciliation because they, for lack of a better term, we're just going to assume they want everything to be nice, neat, and tidy, and, and fixed. But we can't, reconciliation comes on God's time. Reconciliation doesn't come on our time. And reconciliation can't be a way to um, house clean the emotional baggage that we have. So I was happy to hear that we have we can't be too quick into reconciliation. And sometimes we have to sit in the mess. And maybe that is another line that needs to be part of our precious blood spirituality. We're okay with sitting in the mess. Um, I, I was also going to kind of dovetail a little bit off of what Vicky was saying about, you know, spirituality of blood is messy that, you know, you can't fit people into nice, neat boxes and categories. Um, and what does it mean to, you know, be with people who 
you know, with complex personalities, you know, each person is created in the image and likeness of God. You know, how do we sit with those people? Uh, people that perhaps think differently than me, believe differently than me, people perhaps I don't even like. You know, I was before we were talking before this this recording session um, earlier this week. I went to a event at the cathedral honoring Cardinal Bernardine on the 25th year of his death. And outside of the cathedral, there was a group of church militant protesters um, praying for perhaps those people in the cathedral for their conversion to see that perhaps they're wrong. Um, you know, how do we break down those barriers that uh, perhaps keep us apart? How do we get past that mentality perhaps that I have the whole truth, you don't, that you have to be in line with me, I can't be in line with you. Um, you know, those complexities, how I, I, a spirituality of the precious blood somehow breaks down those barriers and helps us to walk forward um, and not let those barriers hinder us as a community, as a people. One thing that struck me about the, the, the uh, problem with being uh, tied up with anger and vengeance on our own is that that leads us into passing judgment on people. We tend to pick people who are good and, and who's evil. And although we need to be aware of the nature of good and evil, it's not up for us to pass judgment on someone else. And that's what anger can tempt us to. And that's something we have to try to avoid. We can pass judgment on ideas of, um, and, you know, recognize the injustice in the world. But as far as calling people out now evil, we don't have the standing to do that since we're all flawed people ourselves. We can't judge, but we also have to be present to injustice, which is what Bob talked about, which I think is different. Um, and to get angry because of a perceived injustice, sometimes we, you know, we're human. We have to have our our pity parties, you know, when somebody did us wrong, so to speak. But um, from on a bigger perspective, though, if we fail to respond to that injustice, we don't do our spirituality credit. You're right. We do have to be present to injustice. We have to witness to injustice. Uh, I grew up in a tradition where, and so I've known Christians from other denominations that rejoice in God setting things right, you know, let's make the bad times happen so that God will kick butt. And we're not called to be the cheerleaders of God's vindication as well. Uh, we're not called to be, I, one thing I, one way I like to put it is we're called to be vessels of God's mercy. We're not called to be vessels of God's vengeance. If we try to call ourselves that, then we are insane. But um, you're right. We have to be, we have to sit in the mess. We have to sit with the injustice. We have to do what we can, but not to lash out in anger, not to get to the stage of rage, which is the danger stage, which is where people get so angry and out of control, they'll destroy their own homes, they'll burn their own neighborhoods, uh, as in a riot where it, we flail around trying to work out this, this energy, this uh, injustice is built up. Bob had a great term that he used that I, I had to make note of. He talked about an underground volcano because sometimes, and I think this happens for every single one of us, where we face the injustices, injustices of our communities, our world, and it just seems to be too much. And he said, wrath allows for a temporary outlet about these insurmountable injustices. But I really like that perception of that underground volcano, because sometimes I think we feel like nothing's happening. You know, nobody's saying anything, nothing's happening. So I really like that image of that underground volcano. Uh, I think there's a, there's a section at the bottom of page 43, I think that relates to all this. It says, uh, 
We all know persons who have felt the heavy tread of the wine press upon them. Uh, talks about the two interpretations, but how important it is that they know that they are remembered by the believing community in their suffering. But when they are imprisoned, battered, and pierced, it seems to them that there is no rescue in sight. Only the one who is mighty to save shall indeed one day bring vindication. And I think there is that sense of waiting, which is a deep part of, I think, this passage, and a sense of prayerfulness that's involved in accompanying people. The reality is, I don't think any of the answers that have been provided in the text or anyone that I ever heard has really made suffering not suffering. But there is a sense of waiting for justice and the hopefulness of it and the faithfulness of it. Well, and the role of hope in all of this is so important. We always need to have hope. Hope keeps us going as we wait for vindication. And people that lose hope are the most vulnerable at all. Hope is what keeps us going in tough times. And so fostering hope is so important in our faith. And on that note, we hope that this week's conversation was helpful to your reading of chapter four. We invite you to put any comments you have in the comment section below the YouTube video or on our Facebook page to which this is linked. Next week, we will be discussing chapter five. So watch for Father Keith's video so you can watch and then join in the conversation. Have a great week.